overview of the content registration process with Crossref and is targeted towards members who are new to Crossref or existing members who want to learn more about getting your metadata into our systems. When content is registered with Crossref, members send us a range of information about the content, but not the content itself. We also enable persist persistent linking through identifiers. I'll go over what content you can register, what metadata you should send us, our persistent identifiers, and the process of crafting deposit files and sending them to us. Just some housekeeping notes before um, we get rolling. Uh, we'll, we will be sending out the recording and slides soon after the webinar is done. I'm Patricia Feeney. Um, I'm in charge of product support at Crestref, and I'll be giving the webinar. There's a question panel to your right. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them as we go along. And I'll try to answer those questions as we go. And if I don't get to all of the questions, um, I'll cover them at the end of the webinar. So what content can you register? We split content into several defined content types. We currently support content registration for journal and journal articles, books and book chapters, conference proceedings and papers, reports or working papers, dissertations, standards, posted content, uh, often those most often uh, encompass preprints, data sets, and uh, what we call components, which uh, are usually used for supplemental materials. You can send us other types of content that don't fit into these categories. These categories collect specific metadata for those different types of content. Um, but if you do have content that falls outside of those categories, we're able to collect most necessary metadata. And um, we're, we're hoping to provide more robust support for an expanded set of content types in the future. When you register your content, you must send us basic citation metadata for every item you register. This includes titles, authors, publication dates, issue numbers, ISSNs, ISBNs, anything that describes the content you're registering and that you will use in a citation. We have minimal requirements because we need to support a large range of publication practices, but we ask that you send us as much metadata as possible and that it be accurate and clean. The more robust your metadata is, the more likely your DOIs will be discovered and disseminated. So when you register your content with us, you're creating a complete metadata record. So we collect a lot of metadata that goes beyond the basic bibliographic uh, data used to cite an item. Um, we collect reference lists, particularly for journal articles, but also um, increasingly for our books. We co collect funding data, so information about who, who is funding the research being published. We collect ORCIDs, which is an uh, identifier for authors. License data, clinical trial information, um, information about errata, retractions, updates and withdrawals, and more through our Crossmark service. We collect abstract, and we're, abstracts, we're starting to collect a lot of data about relationships between items, and we're always adding more. When you register your content with Crossref, you're also registering a persistent identifier. Crossref uses DOIs for identifiers. Um, when you submit your content, you re register the DOIs you've included in your metadata file, and you and everyone else can then build persistent links to that item, ensuring that the links stay viable as the content moves from place to place. We have some basic requirements for the syntax of your identifier. A DOI, um, digital object identifier, consists of a prefix and a suffix. We assign the prefix to you when you become a member. You need to come up with the suffix pattern on your own. We don't assign those to you. When your DOI is registered, it becomes a link when the DOI registry URL at doi.org is added to the front of the DOI. So on this slide, you can see at the bottom, there's a DOI with uh, HTTPS uh, doi.org in front of it that turns that uh, DOI into a link. So over the time, over time, if your content moves, you can update the URL that you've registered for the identifier, and the identifier-based URL will continue to resolve. So anyone who clicks on this link, provided you've, you're sending us up 
updated information is going to find your content. Our identifiers can and do change hands, so if your content moves to a different platform or content moves to your platform, you can update the existing identifiers to ensure persistence. We get a lot of questions from new members about creating a suffix for your DOIs. We have some guidelines and examples, but here's what you really need to know. You need to keep your suffixes consistent, simple, and short. They should be consistent for your sake, so you should establish a pattern that's easy to maintain. They should be simple for the same reason, and you want them to be short so that they don't take up endless amounts of space when used in citations. And I've got a link um, to some more information about creating a DOI suffix, including um, some examples from other uh, members. And again, the slides will be distributed after the webinar is, is done. So now I'm going to go into more detail about registering your content. The basics are simple. You create Crossref XML either through systems on your end or some tools on our end. You send the XML to us, we process it, and you or your systems verify that everything's been registered. So creating XML, everything that comes to our system is ultimately an XML. We've got a few ways around that, but first I'll go over the basics of what we need from XML. Crossref has its own metadata schema for deposits. Um, a schema is a set of rules defining what can be included and in what format. Our schema is fairly rigid, but it is comprehensive. We update our schema regularly to accommodate the evolution of our services, but we rarely do anything that isn't backwards compatible. Our most recent schema version is 4.4.0, but we accept deposits with 4.3.0 through 4.4.0. Um, we have a metadata schema that can be used to deposit everything and create a complete record all at once. We also have what's called a resource schema that can be used to update or add select pieces of metadata to your for your registered content. So for those of you that are going to create the XML yourselves, the in initial XML you create must um, include metadata and identifier. Um, so, as I mentioned, our deposit schema enforces a rigid structure and our elements need to appear in a defined order. Here's an example. Um, every XML file that you send to us has some member-specific information in the head section. So note that there's an email address that is used to send out logs when your file has been processed and you provide that to us in your um, XML file. We also, of course, include metadata in the file. Here's a basic journal article deposit. It contains journal metadata such as the title and the ISSN and issue and volume, volume information like volume issue, numbers, dates. Um, you can also assign an identifier to a specific journal or journal issue if you'd like. Those are optional, but you can do it. A journal article has basic metadata like article title, author name, publication date, pages, and of course the identifier information. So there's the article metadata and at the bottom the identifier and the URL. So that's where you're providing us with the URL that the DOI will resolve to. Here, so everything is sent to us as XML. Here's a sample citation deposit. Um, if you do elect to send us your reference lists for your journal articles, and we hope you do, um, your citations can be marked up, so broken into um, the various metadata components. Um, that's the most accurate way to send in your reference lists, but it's also uh, challenging for some of you. So you can also send us in what we call an unstructured citation, so that's just a regular, regular old bibliographic citation wrapped in some unstructured citation tags. If you are not able to generate XML, we do have some options. We have a manual entry form. It's called the Web Deposit Form. This form is very basic. You enter your data field by field, and it writes and submits XML to us for processing. Um, this form is, uh, honestly, it's near the end of its lifespan. We're going to be rolling out a new tool in early 2017. The first phase is going to only include journal deposits, 
um, but we'll be adding the other content types as the year goes on. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to use. We'll be able to auto-populate fields and add some features like saving and editing deposits that are missing from the current form. So, you know, if you're, you're planning what you're going to be doing in the coming year, uh, that's, that's good information to know if you're using this manual entry, entry form. If you have a system that pr produces JETS or NLM XML, we've written an XSLT transformation for that. Um, you can upload JETS or NLM formatted files article by article to our web form. If you want to expand an existing metadata record by adding license and funding information, you can do that by um, uploading a CSV file with that information to our system using the web form. Um, and I've got a link to instructions for doing that in the slide. So you must deposit metadata and identifiers when your content is initially registered, and you can include all other metadata in your initial registration as well, but some types of metadata can be added post-registration as you are able. These include referenced deposits for our cited by service, funding data, components, which are supplemental material metadata records, um, cross-mark data, text and data mining, and information about relationships between DOIs and other identifiers. So once you've created your deposit file, you, you need to get it to us. You need to um, send it to our system. If you're using the web deposit form, you, 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 you'll skip this step. For everyone else, most deposits are made by HTTP post. If you have any sort of automated system, you'll be doing that. We do have an interface for uploading files one by one, if you need to do that. And as I mentioned, the web deposit form mentioned uh, that we talked about will submit the files for you. When your file has been uploaded, it's added to our submission queue. Most files are processed within minutes, but we can get bogged down if the traffic is high, if a, one of our larger members decides they're going to redeposit everything. That can, that can sometimes slow things down, or if it's sometimes there's just a busy time of year because of publication schedules, um, it can take a little while to work through all of the, the um, files in our queue. So um, if you've submitted something and you don't get a response, you don't get a log sent to you, you can always check to see if your deposit is still in our queue. That's uh, available for members to view, and I've got a link to instructions on how to do that in the slide. So if your deposit is processed sex successfully, great, you're done, your content is registered, um, your metadata record is in our database, and you can start looking persistently. If your deposit fails, you'll need to review your logs and correct whatever issues exist. So we generate a submission log for every file sent to our system. This includes files sent by our um, web deposit form. We send the logs out by email. You can also pull for logs if you have a system that can support that. The logs are in XML, so they're machine readable, and they're somewhat person readable, um, a little bit. Um, I'll show you an example in a second. Um, so here's an example of a submission log. The most important part is at the bottom. The batch data section is a summary of your log results. If the record count and success count match, you're done. Everything was processed successfully. If there are any failures, flagged in failure count, you'll need to address them. A failure means your record was not added to our system. A warning means that the record was added and the identifiers are registered and can be used for linking, but there may be something that needs attention. So if submissions do fail, there are some odd problems that you might run into, but most failures run into three categories. Number one, your XML is not valid. We only accept XML that parses, so if your XML is invalid, the entire submission is rejected outright. Um, we also have some validation that we do on our system side, outside of the XML. Um, we try to do as much validation in our schema so those of you with more robust systems can pre-validate, but some things just aren't possible with XML schema. Um, for example, we make sure that the ISSN and the ISVN you submit in your files are valid. 
your files might fail because of an issue with your title, uh, we want to make sure that the data in our system is correct. So we have some rules for updating titles. Um, we don't allow you to kind of change your journal title on the fly. You have to contact, contact us and have us do that for you, which can sometimes cause problems if you're not consistent in how you're sending us your data. Um, there also may be permission issues. Um, journal titles change, hand, change hands quite often. So if you've, at, you've added or sold a title, please make sure we know about it so we can make it the appropriate ownership changes on our end so your publication schedules aren't affected. So we have one type of warning currently. If the metadata in, in the record you're submitting matches something that's already in our system, we'll put a conflict warning in your log. Sometimes conflicts aren't problems, but most of the time they are. Um, most of the time, if something's been flagged as being in conflict, it means it's a duplicate of another item, of another item or the item you're submitting has very smart, sparse metadata. Both are bad situations and, sh and should uh, deserve some attention. When your content has been registered, a lot of stuff happens. We'll have whatever metadata you've sent to us, and we send it out to a variety of sources. Libraries, indexing services, researchers, educational tools, discovery services, and more. Your metadata is available through many channels instantly, but may take up to a day to bubble up through some other channels. And when you register your content with Crossref, we register your DOI and URL with the DOI resolver, so your identifiers will be ready for linking immediately. We also require our members to link from their reference list using Crossref identifiers. So when your content is registered, our members will be able to discover those identifiers and use them to link directly to, them, to you. So if you need some help, we have a lot of documentation. We have a small support staff. We're in the US um, and give support mostly by email. We have a new support center that has a lot of documentation for more technical issues. You can also visit our website at crossref.org for information. Um, just to give you a heads up, we're releasing a new website in about a week and a half. So if you aren't able to find what you need on our current website. Hopefully in a week and a half, you'll be able to find the interim, find the information you need. Um, but in the interim, if you have any questions, you can visit support.crossref.org and review the technical documentation. You can also open a support ticket with any questions you may have and, and we'll um, be happy to answer those for you. And just uh, when we do send out the slides, I've compiled all of the links that are uh, appear throughout the slides in this last resource slide, so you'll have all of those in one place. And you can always send any questions you have to support at crossref.org. We also have a Crossref support Twitter. All right, that wraps up our webinar. I do have some questions, so I'm going to go through.